yeah. Okay, we'll have we'll an email. After. I'll yeah. email you because I wanted to discuss certain things with you. Oh, That's sure. right. Uh, but I, I just couldn't make it to those events. Oh, no, I appreciate yeah. you. <laughs> I get to meet you. I'm so happy. Yeah, I think that class is really important. To oh, good! I'm you. so glad. Yeah, you're yeah. so glad. Yeah, it's amazing. That was 2000 first Oh, great! Then you went with the you you took the book you took my book the book that I was using around with you. Oh, yeah, yeah. And yeah, I remember sitting in my some soccer game and yeah. reading it and yeah. I remember very. Oh, that's great. And I still use it as a reference. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so when I saw that you were to say I have to attend this, this oh, my so student. Yeah. Well, yeah. that means so much to me. Okay. Good. Good. Thank you for yeah. coming. Sure, oh, sure. Sure. <laughs> someone another will talk. We talk some more when we meet. Yes. Yeah, because I, I, I think that, that when this gets over, we probably don't have time at that point. But I'll, I'll email you. Yeah, I need to take a yeah, here. It's too big. Yes. I want to introduce you to one of our PhD students. Oh, I'm Kate. too. She's from China. Oh, where in China? Um, somewhere in Yesenheim. She was in my classroom. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> you're a better person. Oh, great. And she invited me to things, but I couldn't go with the Yeah. Have you? We were, we were in Hong Kong, so if you can see we're not 2006 to 2010, and then Shanghai 2010 to 2012. Wow, I was in Shanghai 2013 to 2017. I did my undergrad there. Where? Sudan University. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So I worked with students from Sudan to John who wanted to go to university in the US. So I spent time on that campus. It was very interesting. Where did you go to high school? In your hometown? Yeah, mostly. Yeah, so that's huge going to Sudan. Smart lady. What is your PhD in which other expression? This is great for the work you do. Let's see in touch. Do you have a car? Okay. Oh, that's exciting. Okay. Because I would like to talk to you about some of the Yeah. So I think you've been looking at it. There's a lot of, I mean, there's a whole section on Shanghai where the students there, the caliber, and the expertise is completely different from the US. Yes. I would say. The first 22 years of their life, I received a public traditional Chinese education. Yes. And I, after I came here, like, everything was different. I was having to be a Japanese I think it's a really beautiful kind of relationship. Yeah. They, like, from your perspective, yeah. like, what do you see? Yeah. 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 So we'll come talk yeah. to me after. We'll get your, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I think the white looks better, don't you? If it's like being video. No, that's true. I'll just pour it in here. Perfect. Pretend I'm really, you know, fancy. Paper cup instead of a bottle.
It looks okay, right? It's... Yeah, I think this is okay. Okay, great, awesome. I'll just uh, say, excuse me, Eric, for any help. Yeah, I, yep, I'm right here. I'm here for the duration. Thank you. My pleasure. <laughs> I'm a Diahu from uh, Diahu. China, Minzu University of China in Beijing. Beijing. Nice to meet and you. I am a visiting. Uh, I am a visiting scholar at the panel, and I uh, visited Rebecca at the panel. She was a visiting scholar. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, I hope to talk to you after. Okay.
Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, and welcome to the Beans Lecture Series. We're going to get started. If you'd like to grab um, food and drink and have a seat, um, we are delighted to welcome Taru Clavel as our speaker today for the Dean's Lecture Series. Taru is not only an alum of the School of Education, she is an education expert, columnist, and sought after public speaker. Since 2010, she's run her own educational consulting practice, advising globally minded families on a range of issues that include multiple language acquisition, school choice, and how to enroll their children in the United States universities. Taru has written columns on education for both the Japan Times and the Financial Times. And she's made appearances on CBS This Morning, CBS, CNBC, Squawk Box, and the Channel, Ch uh, Channel News Asia. Tru spent a decade raising her family in Asia, and while there, she obtained a master's in comparative international education from our own School of Education here at Drexel <laughs> University. She recently returned to New York with her family. She will be speaking today about her new book, World Class, one Mother's Journey Halfway Around the Globe in Search of the Best Education for Her Children. After Taru's talk, we will have a book signing in the back. I will now turn it over to Taru. Thank you all for coming today. What I'm gonna ask everybody to do is, can we fill up the front a little more? I would love that. If something's <laughs> in the back, they can maybe fill up the agency, can you see what's up? And then can people go to the back a little bit? Don't be shy. I want this to be, I, I, I start a lot of my talks with education can be a very contentious topic. Um, everybody has an opinion about education the way they do about politics and money. I'm sure we talk about <laughs> at the dinner table, um, religion. And uh, I'd like to have as much of a civil dis discussion as possible about different uh, Thank you very much. Um, and I will also preface this by saying it was my publisher who called me an education expert because I feel like I'm in a room with people who have much more expertise than I do. And I appreciate so many of the professors here who taught me and who continue to teach um, upcoming teachers and I was in global and international education programs. So thank you very, very much. Um, so I'm gonna get started. So my book, World Class, just came out with Simon & Schuster imprint, Atria, uh, last month. And it basically chronicles my having raised my kids from 2006 through 2018. And I started, we started in New York City prior to 2006. And then we were in Hong Kong from 2006 until 2010. And that was where my third child was born. And then we moved to Shanghai in 2010 and were there until 2012. And then from 2012 to 16, we were in Tokyo and then moved back to the US, but to California, not to New York City. We're in Palo Alto for two years. And then finally last summer, moved back to New York City. <laughs> so it was, it was a literally around the world. Um, I would like to ask here, who here is on the faculty? Is there a, oh wow, so. You have a lot to teach me. I hope I can do something. Um, and who are master's students? They're online. Okay. And uh, PhD? Yep. Well, you all have so much to teach me. <laughs> um, so thank you. I feel very honored that you are all here. Okay. So the book chronicles of 2006 to 2018. And I did enroll in Drexel's Graduate in International Education program. Uh, in the fall of 2011 and graduated in 2014. And I would be remiss in not thanking Rebecca Pelosi, who was the head of the department at the time and absolutely instrumental, and where's Samantha? And Samantha knows, <laughs> she was my online person whenever there was any glitch, big or small, because um, I was making a joke at our lunch earlier that at the time I didn't know anything about online education, let alone going back to school later in life. So I printed everything out and I probably emailed Samantha about how he was a printer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so thank you very much, Samantha. Um, and when I finished the Drexel program, that led me into a career as an education journalist. I was based in Japan at the time and I loved it. I was so passionate about international education. And the joke I kind of make is that when I came back to the United States in 2016 and people said, oh, what did you write about? I said international education. Like, what, what, what's that? 
was international education. Because where I was overseas, especially in China, learning English was kind of the golden ticket to success in your future. And everybody was talking about coming to the United States, not everybody, but it was very aspirational to come to the United States to go to college or to come to graduate school. And in Japan too, there is such an effort uh, to try to get the younger generation to speak English. Um, and then I, refer, I returned to the United States in 2016, and there was this reverse culture shock. Um, when I left, Obama hadn't even been elected yet, and I come back with three children, and we had another presidential election. And so I kind of look at the U.S. as, you know, I thought my children were so lucky. We all had U.S. passports, which meant that we were welcomed in all these countries, and we're so proud to be American. And then what does it mean to be part of a democracy? And then we come back to the United States. So it's very interesting that from 2016, their view of what it means to be a U.S. citizen, U.S. passport holder, American, may be very different had we have not left um, when we had. So actually, you know, I'm going to go back just a minute. I want to ask why international education matters to every educator in the U.S. Can someone try to answer that question? A few people. I'm going to call on you, and I'm probably going to call Rebecca. <laughs> <because> <laughs> Does anybody want to answer it? Yeah. And I, your comments about coming back to the United States, and we think we're the center of the universe, but, but we're not in. I think we're at, in the United States, and especially the education system, we're going through a lot of growing pains trying to understand that we're part of a larger global education process, and our students need to be globally not only aware, but globally literate, and, and it matters, and we're not going to see the rest of the world ahead of us. I love that answer. Thank you. Yeah. Well, um, in response to the call, well, that's a lot <laughs> We think that you know, we're international travelers. People are going across the borders now. I know when I was in school, um, specifically when you're teaching math, and our students here don't really understand a lot of the concepts, you know, geometry and things like that. Whereas in Japan, they have a better way of teaching it so that you understand it better. Instead of memorization and then doing formulas and you know, trying to teach something that way, we uh, we teach differently so the children will understand. So I think um, international education, finding other methods from abroad mm -hmm. to they work here would be wonderful. Okay. Yeah, so that's a great segue. So while we definitely have to examine the culture, or the demographic, the politics, or the, the history behind every nation, our practices are very different. However, there are some core principles that high-performing nations do share. And that's what I hope to explore with you today. And if you have a pressing question, um, please don't hesitate to ask. Um, our time here is quite limited. I think I have, is it one hour to speak and then 15 minutes for Q&A? Yeah. Okay, so we'll try to stick to that. Um, so if you can, hold your questions to the end unless it's something really, really pressing. Okay, okay here we go. So one of the first classes I took, and I don't know if you all still do this, is what's your educational lens? So I actually start my book in the introduction because I want to be very clear about this is my perspective. We all have different experiences with education. And so I'm very upfront about, literally upfront of my book. So I was educated uh, in a mostly cultural Japanese, culturally Japanese home. My mom was a first gen Japanese immigrant and she's a single mom. I don't have perfect siblings either, so I'm an only child. And going to school, I probably started learning English and speaking English when I was about three years old. And at the time, I was probably the only one all through high school who didn't speak English at home. And I felt like kind of a, the, the strange poster child on international school days who always had to teach everybody origami before they had the, you know, before they had the tiger mom kind of name. Um, I was a one who was in the talent shows playing Beethoven, you know, in, in third grade. And you know, as much as that may sound, I don't know at the time people thought it was very um, accomplished, it just made me feel kind of like an outsider. So I do talk about that in the introduction. So I think it's important, and, and you're all educators or aspiring educators, so you all know that your lens is really critical to understanding the experience. Oh, so I should just say, this is me at Japanese school in third grade, so you see all my classmates. So in the summers, because my family was in Japan, I would go to school in Japan. Um, so I always had this comparative international kind of background, which drew me really to study um, in the master's program here. So here I am, 2006, I have two babies. Um, and my husband comes home and says, we have a job offer to go to Hong Kong. 
And it was one of these things where at that point I thought, okay, so I had this multicultural home growing up. I want to give that to my children, but I don't really know how to do that. I'm in New York City. And when the opportunity came up, it was okay. It was kind of a non-thinking, you're just going to go. Um, which in hindsight was quite naive of me, I think. <laughs> um, but it was an exciting opportunity and it didn't seem that foreign to me because I was half Asian. And that's how naive I felt and how poor I felt like my education was because, and I, I'm very honest about this in World Class too, like I couldn't really tell the difference. Oh, well, Hong Kong, Shanghai, Japan, it's all the same. It's all the same. <laughs> and it's hugely, hugely different, right? I got a, I got a big rude awakening. Um, so I start the book and I talk about the preschool process in New York City, which is likened to a Hunger Games. And, <laughs> and it's right because you have to get into these elite preschools that then they think, okay, we'll go into these private schools where the sticker, right, the tuition is $40,000 plus a year, and then it can take you straight to the Ivy League or a highly competitive university, which we all kind of know, right, that doesn't necessarily happen because once you disaggregate for contribution, legacy, connections, sports, what have you, that percentage is completely different based on your socioeconomic background and your, and your resume, really. Um, so in that kind of milieu, if you want to say, in 2006, I didn't know what to do with my kids because I didn't want to participate in that, but I kind of didn't know what else to do because I want to give my kids the best education. So that was another reason I thought, oh, okay, fine, fine, I'll just escape it all. <laughs> um, and that also started making me think about my education values. And I thought, okay, what is an education? Is it play? Is it academics? How much time do my kids go to school? Do we have before programs or after school programs? Do I go back to work? You know, how much money is being spent on their tuition? And so how involved am I? Do we and do we do I teach them Japanese? It's my first language. So all these things were kind of you know brewing in my mind. And again, Hong Kong was the okay, I can escape all of those things. <laughs> And part of my journey to USC is at this point, I'm, I don't want to say I'm just a mom because it's definitely the hardest thing I've ever had to do, but I'm not thinking about education at this point as, as a scholar or a researcher. I'm really just thinking about it from the perspective of being a mother. So you'll see this journey um, here and throughout my book. So these are things that you probably already think about, but these, you know, this is what I was thinking about. What are the demographics of the, of the students at the school? And then what are your schooling options? In the area. So we go to Hong Kong, and at this point, it's 2006. We're there for four years, and my third child, of course, I'm a boy boy girl, she was born in 2009. And here are these photos, and I'm going to walk through my educational choices here, but I didn't know anything. Right? I'm an expatriate, and everybody said, just put your kids in that preschool down the, down the street. And it was an international for profit preschool. I thought, okay. I don't know the difference between for profit, non profit, and public or whatever. So I enroll my my oldest, who's um, my eldest, who's on the left there. And then it's supposed to be a manner and origin program. But within a month or two, when he's with a bunch of other non Mandarin speaking students mm -hmm. in a Western international kind of environment, he's not picking up any Mandarin, right? And then I start having this kind of identity crisis, thinking, well, then why did we move here if he's not going to learn Mandarin? The local language here is Cantonese anyway. This, this artifice, <laughs> what is going on, right? Um, so I talk about this in world class where when we first got this, people said, if you want Mandarin immersion, you have to send them to this school. It's in the middle of this and that you have to go, but no one wants to send their kid there. And I thought, okay, nobody wants to send their child there. But a few months in, I thought, oh my God, we have to go look at this school. It was nicknamed the prison. <laughs> and it was nicknamed the prison because from the outside, it could actually be mistaken for being a prison. It's just kind of this foreboding big concrete building with a courtyard in the middle where all the buses would go in and just gas up the place it felt like. But it had a full immersion Mandarin program. It was three hours a day and it was a magnet, a public magnet school. So kids all over Hong Kong would bus there. And this is this is my oldest um, on the left here. This is James. And then Charles, my second one came, he's in the twos program here. Um, and yes, people thought for the most part, maybe you were kind of crazy for doing this, but they became fluent Mandarin speakers and they got a phenomenal education. And that's when they started getting homework. My three-year-old started getting homework in the early childhood education, um, right, at, at that age. And the homework was minimal, but it's interesting. I talked to my son who's now 15 about this. He said, there was so much homework. But maybe 
you know, relative or three-year-old, it was a lot. He basically had to copy a character every day, whether it be ABC, a number one, two, three, the Chinese one, two, three, or, or a, um, what am I missing? A Chinese prince, if I don't say that. And it was just copying it over a few times, but it got him in the habit of always doing homework. And so when I come back to the US and people often ask me, how do you get your kids to do homework? It's such a struggle. I don't really have that conversation with my children because my kids have always done homework. It just comes to the territory of going to school. So again, I talked about the school choice. Um, and then before we actually left Hong Kong in 2010, we didn't know that we were leaving. So we started looking at ongoing schools. Where are my children, my oldest, where is he going to go to primary school? And we looked around again at international schools. And we made the conscious decision to say, no, we are staying here and we're going to leave the kids in the local magnet school because this uh, preschool went through to, um, to high school. So that was a, an interesting decision for us as well because not many expatriate families would make that decision. Um, so again, this is when should you introduce a child to a second language? I'm sure a lot of people here know the neurocognitive science really shows that the earlier you start, the easier it is. You can speak like a native as you approach adolescence. It's, 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 becomes more of an additive, uh, non-native speaker kind of a, a process. So I was very lucky because my children were all young enough to be able to learn to speak these languages. We'll, we'll get to Japanese soon as a native speaker. So then we go to Shanghai. And something I didn't talk about when we were in Hong Kong was that it's, it's it, you can have a very luxurious lifestyle. <laughs> and anybody, does anybody, is anyone familiar with this expatriate kind of luxurious lifestyle? Yeah, you can get swept away. Um, and I felt like that kind of went against my values too for my children where people have helpers and drivers and, and live in health. Um, and so when the opportunity came for us to move to Shanghai in 2010, and I use this word, it was a little too detoxy. <laughs> um, I went to the other end. Uh, so this is where we lived. We lived in an old Chinese lane. Um, and this was literally, that's our door right here. And this is what it looked like. And this was our entry area. Um, this was an ex-communist tenement. And we intentionally did this. Most expatriates will live in an all-out development. Many of them will have a grocery store, a club, a fitness center. Some even have attached preschools. Um, and <laughs> I mean, we didn't have any facilities. <laughs> um, and something else that we did was, again, we enrolled our children into these local public schools. And at that point, I had a first grader, a preschooler, and a one and a half year old, basically. And everybody again said, are you crazy? You know, this is a communist country. You don't put your non-Chinese children into these schools. And I said, no, that's why we're here. And a lot of people did pull me aside. Well, right? That's a nice way of saying they thought I was crazy. And I felt vindicated because right when we moved in the fall of 2010, everybody, I'm sure people here are familiar with the OECD Pisa test, right? Mm -hmm. That was the first year, that December, that Shanghai participated, right? And if everybody remembers the first year participated, it blew everybody <coughs> out of the water in math, reading, and science. And suddenly I felt so vindicated. I was like, I knew I was doing something right. I put my kids in these schools. And that's my son. That's his first grade classroom. And you see here he's in a second grade, second grade classroom. And he's got two stripes. And does anybody here know what that is? Anyone want to venture a guess? Anyone? Middle leadership. Middle leadership, yeah. So this is, he, every day he very proudly wore his cap. So there was one uh, three stripe, which is a number one. In his class there were two two stripes and there were three 12 stripes. And it's basically leadership, academic leadership, social leadership. And he was so proud, right? Because he was basically number two in the class. And you can see the, the, the red bow uh, was high around his neck. And that meant he joined the Communist Party <laughs> and he in the second grade, which is a whole other story I talk about in world class. Because I didn't know he had done that and he was so proud. You know, I'm getting a <laughs> So there you have it. Um, <laughs> And something else, mastery, right? It's such a big word, I feel like, in our education system today. And so they don't use those words there. There was one day, and this is a story tell in world class. I had three kids in a country that had a one child in the college. Mm -hmm. And I don't speak Mandarin. And now I can get by. But at the time, I didn't. And I had to pick up my first son at his school, public school. And then I had to pick up my younger two who are at their preschool. 
And we're not, we're here legally, but we're kind of not. These days it's very hard to enroll a non-Chinese, non-Shanghai resident into a local public school. But at this time, it's kind of front corners, you kind of were allowed to. So I'm not making a fuss, right? Because I'm just happy he's having the experience. One day I go to pick him up and I have to get him out at the right time because otherwise I can't pick up my other kids. He's in the room, he's not coming out, the other kids are still right now. And I'm just standing outside the classroom and he's sitting by his math teacher. And there are a handful of kids there. Slowly the kids are filing out, they're doing some kind of math homework. And I'm looking in the classroom going, we have to go, we have to go. You know, because I can't communicate, the cell phone, the, the communication was pretty sparse back then as well. And frankly, I couldn't speak Mandarin, so I can't communicate to the preschool that I'm going to be late. So he's in there for a minimum of an hour. And I'm, I'm just, I'm going crazy. He's on a discipline case. Why is he there? He likes math. Why is he? And so he starts crying. And now I'm like, oh my gosh, this is abuse. Like, what, what, what is this? You know, I'm very brave. So finally, he leaves the classroom. He's crying. We get in the car, and then we pick up the other two. And that story really stuck with me. And I couldn't figure out why that whole thing happened. Right, and I'm writing real talk, I'm writing the book, and I kept thinking about it and thinking about it. And then I realized he wasn't crying because he was kept after school. He was crying because of me, because I was putting pressure on him to leave. So the question is, why was he still there? Because his classroom teacher had a 95% minimum to be to be considered mastering the material. And she kept teacher, she, I'm sorry, she kept students after school until as long as it took for the kids to get that 95%. And she would talk to the families, she would talk to the other students in the classroom to, to pair them up, a stronger student with a lesser performing student, let's say. She would get other families that, they were so wonderful, they would pair me up with another family if I didn't understand what was going on. And they used every community resource, and sometimes these kids would stay after school and be served dinner by their teachers until they mastered the material. And you know, when you talk about the learning credentials, it, it, the learning, um, let's say attainment of these kids, the PISA score will show you that in math and science, our 18 year olds are performing at the levels of 15 year olds in some of these countries, right? So when you think about that, and I will tell you, and I'll fast forward to the history, you know, when we came back to the United States, I had a fifth grader and I had a seventh grader, they were performing two years ahead of math. And that was not the supplementing, it was just because of what they learned in the classroom. And I'm the first person to say, and I know this is being uh, on video, but my oldest is not, like the math is not his, his jam. It's not, he's not mm -hmm. in love with math. But he performed at the average as expectation of the other students that were around him. My second is a little different. He really, he really does love math. So that's just the question of mastery. And something else that was really hugely kind of shocking to me was this whole notion of, we talked about this, globalization of global confidence. Because overseas, that thirst for being global is ever present. If, does anybody, I'm sure you know, EF, EF English first, mm -hmm. EF schools. I mean, you, you can't walk down the street, I felt like, without a flyer or an umbrella or a car that says EF, because everybody's trying to learn, right? Because everybody's trying to learn English there. It's a huge, huge business for everybody to try to learn English. And when we were there in Shanghai, first graders started learning English. And it was considered the third most important class after Chinese language and math. And in first grade, you know, a lot of these kids couldn't speak any English. And we would go back and visit every year, and by third, fourth, fifth grade, these kids were conversing in English. And their teacher, so my first uh, homeroom teacher was actually the English teacher. It was very nice. They, they assigned the English teacher to be the, the conduit for me in the school. She looked like she was about 15 years old, <laughs> didn't even have a passport, never left China. And she spoke perfect local English to the point where she drops into the oopsie daisies. Ouch! <laughs> you know, you never, it, was, it was remarkable. She, she spoke perfect, perfect English. And anytime she could, she would ask me for resources. What books should my kids read? What, what, you know, what, what are the phonics programs that you like? Um, she just was so hungry for content. It was, it was really, really touching. Um, and at the same time, I started working with Chinese students who wanted to come to U.S. universities. And that was a hugely eye-opening experience. And I did that actually because of a Drexel course I took on the globalization. And I was like, oh my gosh, who are these students who are wanting to come to the US? I said, I want to work with them. I didn't do it for the money. I got paid pennies, really. But I did it because I wanted to understand these students. I was just saying, I started working for, with some students who 
I started with students who were at this um, high school called Fudan Fujian, which is a theater for Fudan University, which is one of the top universities in China. And their work ethic, being with these students who are between 16 and 18 years old, I had never seen anything like it before. They were so, I would tell them, you know, you haven't read any English literature or American literature. You have to quote these things. You have to know what's going on in the world. I mean, I will tell you, one student wrote a whole essay for me on how Genghis Khan was a savior of all mankind. <laughs> and, you know, so I was like, no, no, we have to, we have to kind of backtrack here. You're not going to submit that. But <laughs> these students were voracious readers. And if anybody knows anything about the college applications to the most competitive schools, it's really hard to recycle those essays. They're really kind of unique to each school. And they would write and rewrite and rewrite these essays 20 times, 30 times. I would cross it out and say no. And they would turn it around in 12 hours. They were, I mean, to a point, it was, it was a little too much. I'm going to take pictures of what they wanted to wear the interview. Should I wear this flash? I mean, no, it's, it's that's okay. <laughs> um, but it was it was so intense, and I was and I was very strict too because I said, you know, if you are going to take a place at one of these top universities, you have to earn it, right? So I made sure that they would be as as prepared as possible, but also be contributing to the school and the classroom. So um, they would have that kind of creative and critical thinking. So that was an incredible experience too. And I want to talk about global confidence in general. Um, because it's something that is brought up in how do we teach our kids in, in the U.S. about being globally competent. And it's about seeing something bigger than yourself, right? Seeing problems that are larger. How can you contribute to make it, making the world around you better? Um, and I'll talk about that a little more when we get to the film. So here are some questions. Um, I'm just going to let you read them uh, pretty quickly, stuff that we've talked about. Uh, but I will mention something else. And, and again, we are going on to Tokyo but, or, or, or Japan. Um, what are the learning expectations you have for your, your kids in our classroom? And I've heard, you know, it's so arbitrary because a classroom teacher can say it's an 80, it's a 95, what's on it, how many times do you take a test? In this country, I've heard repeatedly, we suffer from 12th place trophies, participation trophies. Those are always have to be a winner. How do we build resiliency when these kids are getting multiple tries? Our anxiety levels are skyrocketing at the adolescent and now younger ages. So what are we doing? Is this, is this correlated? These are things that I would like all of us to consider. Um, I just went to my daughter, so she goes to a Saturday Japanese school for Japanese expatriates who are in the US, so she can maintain her Japanese. Um, and she goes back to school to go to regular local public school in Japan every summer. And she just had her classroom observation. And the teacher there said the mastery level was 80%. You have to get at least an 80%. And because it's not, we're not in Japan, the school was so stringent as to say, there are lots of kids who want to come to this school. If you don't maintain an 80%, you're not welcome to stay here next year. Right? So that's, it, it's interesting, I think, as we're educators, you have to think about what does mastery really mean? And the OECD will define it as, it's not the knowledge, the content, it's how you apply that to the greater world. And that's, I think, something that a lot of people may miss because they think it's just about maybe rote learning, um, your arithmetic, your grammar, your spelling, all that kind of stuff. But I'll say something that does personally bother me is that we're not teaching some of these fundamentals anymore. And there's no way that you can appreciate Shakespeare if you don't know grammar. There's no way you can be good at calculus if you don't know your algebra. Right? And I've, and I've interviewed, so the 2017 to 18 academic year, I, I went across the country and I visited dozens of schools, talked to scholars, went to conferences. And, they're, and, I, and I write about this in, in low class as well. There are plenty of teachers out there who will say, these kids are basically going to have iPads embedded in their, or iPhones or whatever, embedded in their hands. So they don't have to learn arithmetic. You know, they don't have to know grammar. They can just copy paste, they have spell check, they have all this other stuff. But it's the brain that's actually not being used. Like the brain is atrophying if you don't do this stuff, if you don't handwrite. And there are plenty of teachers you may have heard who have issues because when they try to get their kids to write, Within one page of handwriting, they have children complaining that their hands cramp up. Right? Or now there's a movement that they can't use red pen in school because that hurts kids. Right? And then there are so many books that kids aren't allowed to read anymore, which, I mean, Little House on the Prairie made it to the no, no read list. You know, so how much are we protecting our kids? How much are we asking with them? It's just something to consider because it's very different um, where I live. Let me check the time quickly. Um, oh, this is for time.
So then in 2012, we had the opportunity to go to Tokyo, which I will say was bittersweet because we have family in Tokyo. Uh, but at the same time, I felt like we were just starting to reap the rewards of having been in Shanghai, which was a difficult, difficult place for me to adjust to. <laughs> My kids got, got along very, very uh, swimmingly when I heard about it, but it was very hard for me. Um, just to, I mean, we lived with termites and cockroaches and rats, and we didn't have hot water, and electricity was sparse, and so it went on and on. But it really toughened me up. It made me appreciate so much. I mean, we lived, when I say we lived in a place, in, in, a, in an old lane, we went to China in part because I had this, you know, these romantic notions of a country that's growing at a 10 plus percent annual GDP, you know, growth and it's like oh my gosh it's the it's the it's the, it's the gold rush of, of my generation i can't wait to go and what that actually means is that nothing stays the same right i mean you can go to a hairdresser one week and the next month you go it's not there anymore you can go to one part of the city and then four months later it's an entirely new gotham like it's just high rises everywhere and so that was really jarring for me but within that my kids really thrived which i think and i bring that up in part because i think I don't mean to offend anyone. Anything I say, please disagree with me. Um, but there's kind of this negative connotation that a lot of Asian students are not creative and they may not be flexible thinkers. And what I would say is if you're living in China and you're experiencing that kind of growth on a regular basis, you're pretty adaptable and pretty flexible. It was, I'm the one who couldn't get along. <laughs> and I grew up in New York and Frank Sinatra's, you know, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. And my joke was, no, no, if you can make it in Shanghai, you can make it anywhere. <laughs> So here we are, we go to Tokyo, and that's my middle son. Again, they're in local public schools. And at this time, my kids can't speak a word of Japanese. I didn't teach them anything. And they present as Caucasian. So when I looked at these local public schools, everybody said, okay, we'll give you five years. Then maybe they can catch up, you know, reading, writing, and learning. But they hadn't really worked with students whose native language was English, but they had already mastered Mandarin over reading, writing, and speaking. Um, in Mandarin. So my kids were at the grade level. So at that point I had a first grader, a second grader, a preschooler. And they were at grade level within a handful of months. So they sound like they were rocket science, but I didn't mm -hmm. tell them, yeah, they, they, they kind of know this stuff already. Mm -hmm. But because it's similar, the, 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 the written word. And so something that is really important that you've probably heard a lot about, I'm just going to go a little deeper into it, is the notion of community and whole child in, in Japan. And I'm sure I just want to hit the show of hands. How many people here know that six year olds in Japan are expected to be independent? Independent. I'm, okay, so I'm okay. I, I would have thought more, uh, more of you knew this, but kids at six years old, they're raised by six, of, six years old to be going to and from school on their own, and oftentimes to their after school activities on their own. And that can include walking, public transportation, which is a bus. It could be a train, it could be all modes of transportation at six years old. And so how do they get that, right? It's an interesting kind of process. So here you see, this is my, I think he's already in second grade. And he's just walking home with his friends. I used to kind of follow him, but of course it's not cool, so he's going to go away. <laughs> but this is one of the photos. And how they do this is part of the community, they have this program, Coke Cups, it, and it's whole child learning. So what they do is they don't have a janitorial staff. They don't have a cafeteria to school. Everybody, when they take their pencil cases to school, they also take a rag. And that rag has to be cleaned every day, every week. They literally get on all fours and run up and down the corridors, if you've seen these videos, right? Mopping the floor with their rag. They have, they clean the chocolates, they clean the toilets. They serve each other lunch, they clean up after lunch. And what that teaches these kids really, and it's very intentional, it's not only take care of themselves, but to take care of the larger community, that's their classroom. And that started at such a young age. And the way I wanted to kind of manifest itself, that you can see into larger society, is, you know, after the World Cup game, there was all this footage a few years ago, and the Japanese are amazing. They don't leave any, any rubbish anywhere. They carry their own plastic bags, and they go around the stadium, they clean up other people's garbage. You know, because they're always looking, they're taught to look out for their neighbor. And so something else that was really interesting is when they've had kind of natural disasters, you know, there's the Kobe earthquake, or when they have a Fukushima national disaster, there's no looting. People are standing in line and they're waiting and the elders are taking care of them, the younger kids are taking care of them. And there's so much discipline and order. 
because the, com the communitarian respect is so strong there. And it's really taught from early childhood education. Here are the photos of um, elementary, but these are, it really starts in elementary school. So something else that my youngest started at three years old in the preschool there. And it's, and it's, and it really, these start so young. The teachers will tell you, do not do things for them. Don't pack their bags for them. You know, don't unpack their bags for them. Make sure they get dressed on their own. And the teachers will tell you, please, there's mandatory parent education. So to opt out, you actually have to write a letter, get permission to not show up, right? And that's very different. And so people often look at my daughter, who's now, she's 10 years old. She's in fourth grade. And they're amazed because she's so organized and she's so independent. And I would love to take credit for that. And what a lot of it has to do with how she was educated in the Japanese school system. Something else that was really surprising, not surprising, but um, I should say amazing to me was a teacher training. And I'd love afterwards to hear what your thoughts are on this too. But basically, so, oops, let's go back. So this, if you can read this, this is teacher's room. And the US education system is criticized for a lot of things, but one thing is the lack of horizontal and vertical alignment, right? Horizontal amongst grade level teachers are vertical between, between grades, between elementary, middle, middle, and high school. And after school, every single day, every teacher leaves their classroom. They only stay in the classroom if the kids are in there. And they come to this, it's called Shokunin Suku. And it's a room that all, and it's not, it's not a lounge. Everybody's desk is there, they're all lined up and they collaborate there for basically three to four hours, unless they're running some kind of a club activity. Teachers in Japan, I believe, I'll have to look at the latest side of it. They work longer than almost any other OECD nation in the school. Um, and they spend a, most of, a majority of that time collaborating with other teachers, not necessarily in the classroom. So it's remarkable to me because every time I would call the school, and maybe it was because I'm the only one with kind of multiple Western children in the, in the school, but they know it, because there's no cafeteria staff, there's no administrative staff, it was always a teacher or no one pick up the phone or the headmaster, or the principal, or the vice principal. And so, oh, hi, you know, Charles, James, and they're doing great, and they knew everything about my children. It didn't matter who picked up the phone. And they're literally five to 600 kids in school because they're in this room for multiple hours, problem solving together and collaborating. Um, and then the teacher training, something else about it is, it's a desirable, respected profession in Japan. And that's a huge difference. And that's, we, uh, I'll interject my opinion, but we definitely have to change that. Here. So for 38,000 spots, this is the most recent data, for 38,000 spots or 200,000 applicants. And it's just as hard to become a teacher in places like Tokyo and Shanghai as it is to pass the bar or your medical school board too. So imagine what that feels like to be a respected teacher, right, in Japan. Right? I think about it as when you have people over at a dinner party, and let's say you had a doctor and a lawyer and a teacher at the dinner table. In this country, it would be very different from if you had the same scenario overseas. And also, the character for, for uh, teacher in both ch in Chinese and in, and in Japanese is future leader, leader of the future, is actually the character. And every time you say the teacher's name, it's not you know Miss Smith or Mrs. Smith or Mr. Smith. It's Smith Lao or, or Smith Sensei. So every time you're saying the, the teacher's name, you are saying like teacher leader of the future. It's already an honorific that's built in. And in Japan, the kids, before they stand up and they raise their hand, before they're called on, they oftentimes, not always, but most classrooms, they stand up, push their chair, in, and then they speak, and then they do the same thing at the end, right? They put it back down. And before every class, you bow to the teacher and you say thank you. And at the start, at the end of the class, you do the same thing. You bow every single class. So there's so much respect already inherently built into that system that is pretty remarkable. And something <coughs> else I'll talk about is how do you communicate with your families? Right? Something that I thought was so different in, in both Shanghai and Tokyo from what I see here is that kind of a perfectly triangulated relationship, right? Between the teacher, the parent, and the student. In here, there's a daily journal that goes between the teacher and the family. And it can be about anything. It can be, you know, if you have 
struggle, struggling with um, some kind of a character, getting an upset stomach, um, literally anything. He had a fight with his sibling today. He may be in a bad mood. And these teachers have, on average, the elementary level, about 35 kids per class, 32 to 35, depending on the, on the, um, on the grade in the elementary school. And the teacher goes through every single one of these journals every day, makes a comment back. And it goes back and forth, back and forth every single day. Something else I will say, and in Shanghai, I'm just going to go back because it's about the teacher and I'm trying to make the relationship. Guess how many pages the report card was for my elementary school son in, in Shanghai? Ten. Ten pages? Anybody else? 46 pages. I'm like, wow. And when I first got it, I thought, this is just going to be all, you know, I'm in a Chinese school, it's all going to be. He knows his math, he knows his rhythm, he does whatever, he just, it's just going to be all about the academics. No such thing. In, for starting in first grade, there's subject specific teachers. So there's an English teacher, a science teacher, a math teacher, a reading teacher. And every teacher for every subject wrote morals, ethics, uh, arts, there were a bunch of different subjects. The top half was about the academics, the second was about contribution to the class. Uh, I think motivation, uh, things like that. And the 46 pages also required not only the teacher's comments, but the parent comments and the student comments, which I thought was brilliant. And, it, and there you have a perfectly triangulated relationship. And I used to love going to pick up and seeing, oftentimes it was the grandparents, both parents often worked with the grandparents to pick up the kids. So I'm there with a bunch of grandparents, and you'd see them talking to the teacher, looking at the child, talking to the, in that meeting. Was so important because so much was invested in that one princeling child because at the time it was a one child policy. Parent involvement. So let me check the time quickly. Okay. So this was another thing that was pretty shocking. I, I tell this story in the book and I'll just give you a brief overview. Uh, but in elementary school, the public school, the typical requirement is that one parent has to volunteer for a full year, mandatory, for each child they have in the school. And then you kind of wonder why the birthday is going wrong, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right? So, but that's a requirement. And this can be a full-time job. I mean, you can literally be at the school for, for 40 hours with your requirement. Um, and I admit, I kind of played that I don't speak Japanese hard, so I got it. <laughs> but, but you're not supposed to. Um, but literally, if you are Japanese, the only way you could get out of this requirement at my son's particular school was if you were ill and had a doctor's note, if you were pregnant and had a doctor's note, or if you were planning on getting pregnant and had a doctor's note. Mm -hmm. And you had to make this public to everybody because it was your responsibility. And if you didn't carry your weight, someone else was going to carry your burden for you. And I saw a fight like this go on, which is highly amusing. I think we need to look at it. Um, and something else that's really interesting, and I'll just throw this out there as a little story. You know, rock, paper, scissors. I think Japan has like thousands of iterations of that. I mean, they dance to it, they have curry rice pie, and they have like, it's, it's, it's a fascinating thing. So much is determined on rock, paper, scissors. Because it's arbitrary, right? You're not going to fight about it. It's not this, it's not fair. It took 20 hours. It's just, it literally, you can get your PTA assignment where it can be 10 hours a week or 40 hours a week for an entire year based on rock, paper, scissors, okay? So in my, in my daughter's preschool, this is me, I was on the games committee, and it took up, I want to say 20 hours a week for about six months. And on, <laughs> you go to just called the 100 game shop, it's like the dollar store, right? And you buy all the supplies to make all the games, and it was so ritualistic, right? Every single thing you purchased had to be presented. We were told to wear navy dresses, actually suits, when we presented to the entire school, and it was like you had to go to this level to get this approved, and it had to go to the next level, and then the school head had to approve it. And it was, and while it was absolutely maddening at times because you probably couldn't get an approval for three weeks on something as small as purchasing a sponge, literally, there was order to it. And I just contrast that to let's think about the curricular reforms that we have in our classroom. Right, or if you're a teacher, you can say, Oh, I'm on a cool app tonight, I'm gonna to use it for my kids tomorrow. And then sometimes our kids get lost in this, right? When there are a lot of holes, and then one teacher does it this way, and then the next year teacher, and then you don't have all that alignment. Japan is almost like probably the exact opposite because things aren't changing that rapidly. 
something else I'm going to talk about briefly, briefly I think, in the, in the next few slides about education governance is curricular reforms in, in Japan happen every 10 years. And there's a Ministry of Education with teachers that study every single reform that will take place. It's a highly centralized system. In Shanghai, it's well, I, we were in Shanghai, but China is much more decentralized, but the educational reforms aren't as rapid as they are here. And there is a very strict, um, what should I say? It's like a, a approval process that happens at the provincial level and at the first, second, and third tier uh, district, uh, what should we call it? Departments of Education. So here's some questions um, to consider if you are practicing uh, or hoping to be a teacher. But a lot of it, I feel like, what's so important is how do you plan on collaborating with your families? And something I thought was so interesting, I'm, I'm sure people here are familiar with Joyce Epstein's six, six types of parental involvement. I, I worship that woman, I'll just say. <laughs> when I first met her, I thought I was meeting a, a, a superhero. Um, but what's so interesting is it kind of doesn't exist, I felt like, where I was, because it's a parental involvement is just so obvious. And it's, it's, it's very common what's expected of you where I was in Asia. Whereas here, you know, do you get involved with the PTA? Do you go read to your child? Like, what are you supposed to do as a parent? Do you give money to the booster organization? Do you go to the library? Are you supposed to be involved with your son's PTA when he's in high school? Are you supposed to run through the school book? There's so many things. It's almost like you need a manual for parent involvement in this country. And that's very different from, from where I was. And then we wanted to come back. So 2016, we go to Palo Alto. And reverse culture shock, rude awakening. I put my kids in the local public schools again. Um, I'm just going to check the time. We're so good. And I'm just going to bullet point for you what we came back to. I had, at that point, a seventh grader, a fifth grader, and a second grader. So I had two in elementary and one in middle school. And within one year, there are five secondary schools in Palo Alto. All five secondary school heads quit. The superintendent quit. My fifth grader had five classroom teachers that year. My middle schooler had, was on the fourth principal in four years. And we're talking about a district that was ranked number one by leaders.com two years running and has some of the most educated, affluent <laughs> taxpayers probably of, of any city maybe in the country, right? We're talking about Zuckerberg, Sergey Brin, Google, right, Apple, they're all, they're all right there. And this is what's happening in Palo Alto. And sometimes I'd be looking at my friends, my parent friends, and say, why isn't this making national headlines? Like, why don't people know about this? And when we think about it, why isn't it? Right? And it's, it's interesting. And it's because there, there are lots of things happening in Palo Alto, including it having been a relatively sleepy college town, maybe a generation earlier, it's in the backyard of Stanford. And then now you have a huge influx of Silicon Valley money and a lot of international families coming in with a very different set of expectations and values. So it was almost like an anthropological study when you went to the board meeting because you have these Chinese families petitioning for, um, how should I say, <coughs> higher learning expectations, uh, math tracking. Um, they wanted to, what's the word I'm looking for when you, when you Put your GPA, you can put it to a 4.5 or a 5 or a 10 on your AP or a, or a weighted GPA. Weighted GPA, that's the word, thank you. They wanted to weight the GPAs. And this is a district, right, that's had, this was very well known, but they had two suicide clusters, right, because of all the stress in Palo Alto. But yet you have this influx of new people coming in, so they wanted to weight the GPA, which is a more competitive, right, because then you want to take the honors of the AP courses rather than the electives and classes that you may not get the higher the opportunities in a 5.0. So there's a lot of stuff going on here. And I kind of thought, wait, what's going on? I'm supposed to be in this really, really great school district. And it was very, very difficult to even get my kids in the right math class because they did have a track record of, of where they had come from um, in the US system. And this is when the equity story really, I mean, if, if I were to pick one thing that's wrong with our education system, I would say, equity, right? And that's not about spending $10 for this child and 10 for another. It's about making up the difference. And, you know, for some states, in, in New York City, 20,000 20, plus per pupil is spent. In Utah, where I spent some time too, you're looking at just over $7,000 per pupil, right? And this is adjusted for cost of living. And then we wonder, if, do teachers want to go into this profession? Do they get paid? Do they have to have multiple jobs to make a living? 
in Palo Alto where I was and in Menlo Park when they were in town, guess what the average teacher salary was? 70,000? Any other guesses? 50? 120,000 dollars. And they still can't afford to live there. They still can't retain teachers. Right? And these teachers oftentimes had to leave their homes between 5 and 6 a.m. to beat the traffic. Otherwise, it could take two hours to get there from where they live. And while I would love the teachers to stay after school, to stay with my kids, if they don't get out the door by 3 o'clock, they hit that traffic going home. So we're not even talking about, you know, tenure in unions. We're just talking about pure logistics and cost of living. So there are all these equity issues, and I'm sure we could have I don't know, I don't know how many volumes of books and conversation about this, but it really struck me because where I was, there were some practices that would prevent uh, students from having different kinds of experiences. So let me give you a few examples. In Japan, the, the school year ends mid-March, and then it begins April 1. In our first year there, go to school April 1, and there are all these new teachers, the older on the plate, they work in the announcement, where do these teachers go? The district shuffles teachers around every two to three years, both for their own professional development, but for equity. So you don't have good schools and bad schools, which was brilliant. And then to avoid the lack of horizontal and vertical alignment issues that you may have, in elementary school, for example, the teachers rarely stay in the classroom in the same grade level for more than one year. So one year they're teaching first grade, the next year they're teaching sixth, elementary goes one through six. The next year fourth, third, and that's part of their career development. And it helps the kids too, right? And I'm not saying every teacher in Japan is great. That doesn't happen. I mean, there are plenty of stories where you get stuck with a, with a not great year, let's say. Because there's some teachers who, and they'll admit it. I'm better with first graders than I am with sixth graders, first graders than sixth graders, right? But it, but it helps with the uh, equity issue, really. Um, and in China, you know, there are lots of issues, there are lots of situations where they will take a struggling school and pair it with a, a successful school, let's call it, and the successful school will take over the management of the less performing school, or they will have some kind of partnership where the more <coughs> driving school will be penalized if the less one is performing. This is a big one, and this is one of the last talks I'm going to talk about. Education fund, and this was huge to me too, because within the first week that my fifth grader was in the classroom, he was given an iPad. No parent was told, the teacher was new, and she was eight months pregnant, <laughs> and she said there were no controls on the iPads. It was something the PTA had fundraised for and gave them to the fifth grade. And she told the kids, I use my iPad for everything. I read everything on here. You can download whatever you want. Here you go. <laughs> so I go to his room at night and there's like a glowing under his sheet because he's on the <laughs> iPad. <laughs> right? And I'm going, so I go to the principal. I said, this is my new year. I, 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 I'm new to the country, basically. Like, is this a normal thing? And he goes, the kids aren't having iPads. What are you talking about? I said, no, no, the kids got them. So he didn't even know. Right, and this was something that was kind of a rude awakening because this was the pervasive kind of practice within Palo Alto. At least, yes, it was. But I'll say I'll just speak to what I know uh, in this classroom. So then I started thinking about so who's driving this technology? Because where we were, there was no technology in the classroom. And if you look at who's majoring in the STEM fields in this country, both at the undergrad and who's coming into graduate school, especially in engineering, they're Asian students primarily Chinese and Indian. They don't have technology in the classrooms. And there's more and more research that shows, right, the American Academy of Pediatrics even has studied, McKinsey, o OECD, they're all saying technology actually can hurt learning outcomes. Mm -hmm. But yet, in this country, we are pushing one-on-one, -on -one, starting in early childhood education, right? So that was, a, that was a really, really, really big shock to me. And then I tell a story in my book where, I don't know if you're familiar with the app, uh, Class Dojo. Mm -hmm. And I wanted, and I used to drive on 101, and I used to see the Class Dojo building, and I'd be like, oh, oh this is so bad. <laughs> because my son would get a grade every day on his behavior. And it was 10 different points, you know, all social points. And if he didn't get a 90%, he got a big fail. And I'm like, oh my God, my kid is failing social, like, social skills every day. <coughs> But this teacher had 20-something students, and she's like, 
on her phone instead of just she telling my kid, maybe you can quiet down. You know, maybe maybe you can sit sit quietly or whatever it is. Instead, she's doing this, and I was like, let alone the privacy issues. And what if he wants to run for president and someone finds out he can't sit still? You know? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, this is but then I, so I wonder who's driving all of this curricular reform and the education governance around the system. Because where I came from, you couldn't just implement a curricular reform overnight. And it was very, it, it was regulated far better by higher government levels. And I'm not looking at my notes, so I hope I'm not missing anything too big. <laughs> um, let's see. Okay. So. You know, I think it's just important to know where your mandates are coming from and why you're doing what you're doing in your classrooms. Um, I, I read, maybe it was an Andy article um, about the teacher who's so excited to use Alexa in her classroom because it reminded her when students need to take medication. And I was thinking, this must be a violation of so many levels, right? <laughs> right? So, and I understand our classrooms are highly underfunded, right? There's, what I think uh, teachers spend several hundreds of dollars every year to get supplies for their classrooms, which isn't a property, right? So I understand when Apple comes in and says, oh, I'm going to make you teach every year, I'm going to give you all this technology, and, but I think we just have to be so mindful of what this is actually doing to our kids, because I miss those days when the math teacher saw where the kid was making the mistake in their, in their, right, in the problem solving, right? And kids these days really, they don't have the stamina that we used to see, the resiliency, and it's where are they getting that from? Because back in the day when I went to college, I'm 46 years old, and I got those blue books for the exam, <laughs> and you made a mistake and you're writing in pen, I mean, you may as well fail the class, right? There's no deleting and going back and doing all that stuff. There's much more accountability in every thought for every word. And these days, like, it's not what's retained, how much investment is being put into the learning. So, Here's some final uh, parting thoughts. Of course, the last and most important, please buy and read world class <laughs> or listen to the audio. I did the audio recording. Um, and I do think it's so important that we learn from other education systems and what they are doing right. They're not doing everything right. And I talk about that in world class too. I mean, there are definitely issues in some of these countries. And after the PISA scores came out, actually, I went to the head of my son's elementary school, and this is, it was previously called a key school, you're not supposed to be called that anymore, it was a tier one school in Shanghai, so basically if there are educational forms that take place, they happen there, they work, and then they disseminate and teach the other schools in the district. So he went to one of the top schools, so I went to the, to the principal of the school, and she, she was there for 18 years, I believe, very, very respected in the district, and I said, very naively, I said, oh my gosh, she must be so sad, excited, the PISA schools came out in Shanghai, so, but she was, He's so mad at me. Are you kidding? Look at this place. We don't have proper gym facilities. Look at our art room. Look at music. We have so much left to do. This is not acceptable. And that's when I realized any critique that is going on of the Chinese education system, just you wait. Because they are on a mission. And during the State of the Union address that Xi Jinping gave, he mentioned education dozens of times. The other night, I watched the, if anybody watched the debate, the fourth democratic debate, mm -hmm. I don't think education was mentioned once. Mm -hmm. Right? So, with that said, I'd love to open it up to any questions you may have. presentation was tremendous and I like a lot of what you're talking about and I read your book The Best in Shanghai and a lot of it yeah. you mentioned there. Uh, but just the other day I was reading about these private schools in China that are using AI uh, very individual you know students working on a computer and and moving in that direction and that seems to be grabbing hold uh, at least in certain areas so I was just wondering if you had any knowledge of that because it seems counter to what you're saying, the way it really exists over there, or maybe that's just Shanghai, and uh, this is occurring elsewhere. It's not my area of expertise for sure, and I'm sure there's students here who address that. Um, but for the most part, technology is still very limited in the classroom, and phones aren't even allowed in the schools. 
and it's very heavily monitored. So if they're doing something like that, it would be on a much smaller scale that they could, this is what I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. um, I would ask everybody to do their own searches on their own, but it would be kind of a small story that's gaining a lot of traction. Um, there's no question we all have to face AI and what's going on. I would make the argument that because AI is coming and technology is so strong, our human skills of connecting the dots mm -hmm. is that much more important, right? So I, I, I can't address that, but I would say what's interesting about that probably is, oh, this is a good, this is a good story. So I'm in my GIE program. I forget who exactly was teaching it, and it was it was a poli it was a policy class, and I decided I was going to take the education policy for my son's um, elementary school in Shanghai, and I can't read Chinese, right? And so I had someone translate it for me, and then I compared it to recent research that I just happened to come across from the Graduate School of Education from Harvard, and it was verbatim. <laughs> and I was going, wow, they are on it. So I would say. They're watching this like a hawk and figuring out how to raise this next generation to be as economically viable and productive for the country as possible. That would be my assessment, but definitely. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think the AI and the neural technology that they do in the charter school that we can add to school for them. Yes, the schools are usually from wealthy families and they are they paid for those programs. They want to actually more the teachers their own learning. So they are not common, and most schools um, in China are actually public schools. So the technology is really important, and we found our first school. I think we found one of them. Yeah, and I was just going to. I would also say that when you when you if you do any research on this, I think it's really important to disaggregate too when technology is used by kids because there's lots of data out there that say, oh, you know, kids in China, Japan, they have smartphones, they have computers, but they're not used in the classroom. And oftentimes that data is not separated out. So people think, oh, 45% of kids here have it, but they don't, because it's not, it's after school. Any other questions? Thoughts, ideas, yeah. You mentioned in your talk that um, you found that natural creativity would come out because of their living conditions and things they had to deal with and things that sort. And that they're very good at doing the math and learning. But what about putting things to use in terms of creativity and developing new products and new ideas? It's been my experience that particularly Chinese culture and Japanese culture, Russians you know, really are looking forward. They, they, the way that people are preparing education is very regimented and a way of thinking. And they're looking now for people to break out of that mm -hmm. pattern. Did, did you find that at all? Um, it's kind of what the principal said to me. We're not teaching our kids the arts, sports, music, as well as we should be. Uh, it's a really complicated question, right? Because you're talking about 1.35 billion people, right. and that's just China. And even if you say only 1% of that is, is creative, you're still looking at a more creative population probably than our students do. Right, so on scale and relatively. But I think for the most part, when, I get asked this question all the time. Right, but we're so creative and innovative in this country. And so I want to throw it back and say, so what are we good at here? What are, what are, what are we creating? And what's that? There's two. <laughs> Class two. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> we get a great on it. But, but when you look at Silicon Valley too, right? What percent of that is actually US citizen, US educated Silicon Valley? So much of that is not. You know, and when you think about what, here, and we'll talk about the socioeconomic disparities, the conversations that are driving kind of crazy are, well, look at Mark Zuckerberg, and look at these guys, or, or Bill Gates are so creative. And the, do you know how socioeconomically dis not an advantage they were prior to going to Harvard? They went to Harvard for their connections, and then they didn't have to graduate. Because, they were, I mean, Mark, Mark Zuckerberg spoke seven languages before he got to Harvard, and he went to Phillips Academy after that. You know, so when we talk about, you know, and there's this whole conversation we can have about intergenerational mobility because it's decreasing in this country hugely. You are cursed with what you were born into, right? So, so we don't leave talent on the table. I really think we have, we need to really teach these kids the basics, the fundamentals, get them right so that they can survive and be creative with the knowledge they have. It's that application. And I can tell, and I talk about this stuff a lot. So I live in New York City and and I went to Carnegie Hall a few weeks ago. It was a Friday night. I 
And I went to a concert by a Japanese conductor composer. And typically when I go to Carnegie Hall, I bring down the average age <laughs> by probably 20 years, <laughs> right? And that's not a compliment to me. It's saying when we don't teach the arts in our schools, we can't support the arts. I wonder what's gonna to happen to these institutions. When I went to the Japanese composer's concert, I would not be exaggerating if I said 95% of the audience were Asian, and I probably brought up the average by 10 years at least. And you think about how these other countries are educating about music, right? In Japan, to become a teacher, you have to swim in every kind of lap or stroke in the pool. You have to be able to twirl on the bar. It's kind of a joke. It's like before the teacher exams, everybody, you see these adults, teachers in training, it's a, it's a playground trying to twirl as <laughs> part of their exam. Um, and they have to be able to play the recorder, sight sing, and sight read and play the piano. That's on top of learning their subject. So they're getting taught that, but you're not going to come, you're not going to find a Japanese citizen who doesn't know how to play the piano. So <clears throat> who's going to go and appreciate the arts? You know, so I, it's a really complicated conversation. And I don't want to say creative or not creative. I think the future will tell. But what I meant to say more about the, the change in China is that you have to be so flexible and adaptable if everything around you is changing at such a high rate. So whether or not that translates into creativity is, a, is another conversation. But it, it, it's something else I also want to talk about, and this may be relevant, I hope. I started going to Japan in the 70s, right, pre-bubble period. And then it was the 1980s with the bubble period. And everybody saw it. I mean, money was flying into the sky in Japan in the 80s. Sony, they buy Rockefeller Center, and they've got Toyota. And, you know, so many movies were about that. And then when I went to Shanghai, I felt like it was so similar. Like, oh my gosh. This is the same kind of thing happening. So, you know, there's so many amazing architects and artists and such coming from, from China and Japan. The problem is they don't speak English right now. English is the most commonly spoken language. So we have Hollywood and people, right? Our media is such a strong deal. Uh, but you know, there's plenty of analysts now that were saying 10 years from now, currencies aren't going to be pegged to the dollar. They're going to be pegged to the renminbi. They're saying, Chinese is going to be the lingua franca. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're, we're in a really interesting time right now. And as teachers, we have to prepare our kids for this because I think, you know, we have to think about, you know, it's so hot in winter now sometimes and it's stifling in the summer. Can you imagine what's going to be 10 to 20 years from now for our kids? It's, a, it's literally a different world. And that's what we're figuring out how to educate our kids for. But yes, I'm sorry. So there's a book called Catching Up and Leading the Way, written by Frank Young. When I was in grad school, I had it. Yeah. And he often talks about Chinese yeah. education and, and U.S. education. But one of the things that we should, we should, like that that that's really important is that when it comes on to the PISA or TIMS or pearls and that kind of stuff, the U.S. has never been number one in any of those things. And those those tests started like in 1950, 60, right, post World War II, right? So it's never been number <coughs> one. But the U.S. was always ahead in terms of productivity, the big economy, and that kind of stuff, and of that kind of stuff. So in this book, he's making the point that those tests don't really matter. They don't show what, you know, those are tests. You know, the, the, the question is, how do we apply those things later on in life? Which is why a lot of those kids come to college in the U.S., mm -hmm. right? So when, when I sit down with those tests, I think they're relevant to what kids know now, but for the long-term projections, the implications of those things are not yet known because of what happens when they come to the U.S. as well. So, you know, there's just a lot of confounding, a lot of conflation, so to speak. But in the U.S., I'm just saying that, you know, in the U.S., we're polished, and I'll say we're, 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 we're around 20, we're around 50. But we're never number one. We're, we're lower never, than that. We're, we're, yeah, but we were never, we're never, we're never in the top 10. But we've been going down right? year after year. Yeah, but but, but the, the, the point that the, the young girl was making that, what makes the U.S. really good in the latter part of higher education, that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. was the early foundation in the arts, and so, 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 so forth. And in fact, they've shown that, the, 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 the studies and correlations that I've been, the biggest correlation is with ELA, English language arts. That's the correlation for this is long term stuff, because in mathematics and science, that kind of stuff, the reason why a lot of kids perform poorly in those sorts of stuff, they can't read well, they can't comprehend what's going on, because their English is fairly weak. And so, and, I, and, I, and 
Another big thing that Yanzo talked about is the same thing with people do research in educational technology. Using technology in classrooms doesn't give education technology as easy, right? Because that technology could be a chalkboard or a regular piece of chalk. So the idea of bringing these tech in the classroom and that kind of stuff, that's not really ed tech or learning sciences and tech. That's just pretty much doing the mundane stuff because I put, you know, brick and mortar to the brick, brick and brick and mortar, but that's not typically it was supposed to be done because there's a huge disconnect between K-12 education. We know that for a fact. There's a huge disconnect between K-12 education and what research is showing. And that perfect that that, that, that persists in just because as you said at the beginning of your talk, a lot of politicians have zero ideas about education what people learn, but they're the ones driving it. For sure. I appreciate you saying and something else I want to add to that, and it brings up the question of productivity of US universities as well. Something that is so beautiful about the liberal arts education um, that I'd like to be reminded of myself is that we don't have to declare a major until the end of our second year. And in most countries, if you want to be a doctor, um, you have to kind of know by the time you're at the end of your elementary school. Because then you have to play in what middle school you're going, and that sets you up, right? Whereas in this country, granted, you will be in school for longer, right? If you become a doctor, you don't have to make those decisions until later. And something that I would say, which is a problem, right? I mean, there's some schools that have no majors in humanities these days, right? But I don't think there are many high schools who say, I'm going to be a religion major or a philosophy major. In those first two years of college, right, that's, that's what it's for. You can shop around, and that's the beauty of, you know, maybe you can be an engineer, but you can minor in, in philosophy or religion or whatever that is. And that is a beautiful part of the U.S. system um, that, that really has kind of no equal elsewhere. Yeah. Uh, um, one I like about the reading of this system is late bloomers still have oh. opportunities to excel. Mm -hmm. Things happen in all the high schools without it. They didn't allow it. And it's like, oh, it takes oh, off. Oh, I'm sorry. But it, it's also something else that I learned when my son was in school. I went over to GAMP, which I think is called Gerard Academic Leaders Program. So uh, I asked the guy, what, where do these students go after they graduate from here? Because I'm thinking, this is going to produce, you know, your great composers and everything else. And he said, no, hey, you know, I'm some lawyers, doctors, anything else. And I was like, ah, I don't get it. But now, you know, I do get it. You know what I mean? The program gives them the discipline you know, that they need for those professions. And that's what's so beautiful, how you mesh the art with scholastic. And it's an outlet. And a lot of times, you know, when you're studying, you know, to become a lawyer or a doctor or whatever, you need an outlet. And so someone who's gone through the art program, it's just like I say, women have a lot of skills. You do quilting. It's a great way of teaching a child math. You know what I mean? And when you have, um, we we'll call it, uh, what is it, not kinetic learners, but tactile learners. That's a good way of teaching them math. I'd like to add to that. This is more of a personal anecdote, but my middle child is now in eighth grade, and the school requires her to take Latin. How many kids take Latin these days? One percent or one percent or one percent. Okay, <laughs> but it's very, you can't even find Latin speakers for the most part, right? And so when they had a parent uh, open house evening, what the teacher said to me, I love. She said, you know what? This is going to teach your kids persistence, patience, metacognitive understanding and she went on with all these skills that i don't think she's going to learn in any other classroom mm -hmm. and so you know part of educating your child is figuring out the right balance and mix of what's happening today when they're getting more technology for example or what does sports mean right sports has really shifted in this mm -hmm. culture because a lot of parents will think rightly or more wrongly that it's their ticket to getting into a top university when I, the chapter that I didn't include in here, I had a chapter on sports actually. So I did, I interviewed lots of D1 mm -hmm. coaches and psychologists and things like that. And there's so much road that we don't, we don't see, right? There's so many people who make it, but we don't hear the stories of all the kids who've been injured, who have student debt, who never were college ready to begin with and were shoved into the, to the whatever college they went to. And one of, one of the people I spoke to, I'm sorry, I don't remember exactly who, but he said, all you got to do is send these parents to a national recruiting event. And then they'll see the top athletes and their kids, just because they were the MVP of their local little league, they're nothing on a national level. So that was interesting. So yeah, it's, I think it's about figuring out the balance these days. A little related to um, what I'm at, oh, about late bloomers. I'm just curious um, if the differences that you have observed between um, 
is special education, differentiated learning, learning challenges. So children, students in Asia who have learning differences or are neurotypical versus how it's um, accounted for or managed. It's a great question. I hope that it's not my area of expertise. I get asked this a lot. Um, I do know that China came out and said by 2020, they are going to have a space for every, uh, every special needs child in their school. And they're making efforts to do that. Whether or not it happens, whether, I mean, that's a whole other thing, but they are making big strides to do that because previously, uh, previously they weren't really taken care of within the school system. Um, Japan, they have paraprofessionals that, that accompany the children and they have programs. Um, something I will say, and this is just theoretical, it's just based on my personal experience, but what I noticed is here, and actually I have been to behavioral health uh, conferences and I've spoken to um, psychiatrists who administer medication and, and all this kind of things. They are the first to say we over medicate in this country. They are the first to say this is a cocktail and we don't know how it ends because we're always shifting. We can't get these kids off the medication. And what I noticed in Japan and it was, you know, it's like a naughty kid in my class. You know, I almost thought it was funny because everybody in the class kind of the class clown, the one who maybe speaks out of turn. And those kids were always, their desks sometimes were literally right next to the teacher's desk. <laughs> and I was like, it's, kind of, it's not a naughty corner. It's like they're right, literally, like if this is like right here. And he would talk out of turn, whatever, but everybody knew and everybody, you know, worked around that child or those children. But there was never the, we're going to medicate the child. This child has a problem. They're just kind of naughty. Maybe they're going through something. But then, lo well, and behold, two years later, they're not the naughty kid anymore. They've calmed down. And that's just anecdotal. I just have to. Share, I just feel like in this country, you, you, it's sometimes, you know, I didn't talk about this because, it, but it is part of the autonomy. So when we talk about free range parenting versus helicopter parenting, something that I don't take that we don't take into mind is free range parenting means you're letting your kids free. You know, let the kids be kids sometimes. I feel like in this country, they're inundated with really inappropriate content on TV. You know, you can't take public trade shows because you're not making on, on, you know, some advertisement. And you watch sports, you watch like a football game. Those ads are, in my opinion, completely inappropriate for some young kids. You know, and, and if you look at like a an R rating for a movie 30 years ago versus now, mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. it's like you're watching a black and white movie. I mean, it's, just, it's just so. Let the kids be kids as much as you can because in this country, they're not nearly as protected as around in other, in other countries. China's trying to make Fortnite illegal. Right? It's, it's a very different set of standards that we have here. Well, thank you. Fifteen minutes and a half an hour to like mingle and talk to Turu. We want to thank you so much. This is My pleasure. And we have a book signing in the back that Turu is available. If you buy your books, just give you a personal signature <laughs> message. Yeah, yeah. So. Please, please come and, and not only buy the book, read the book, discuss it, share it, talk to other people. And I don't expect everyone to agree with anything with everything I said. I don't. Everybody has their own ways of doing things. It's just I'd rather have my story be told. Uh, because I think it's important that we have a starting point from which we can make changes in our education system. All right, so please bring me and stay in touch. I have a sign in sheet if you want to uh, stay in touch, and I'll, I'll let you know about events and such. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you learned something. <laughs> Is it okay? That was right there with my first CIES presentation. <laughs>